Today, our guests are Rebecca Antle and Wendy Goblin. Rebecca is the Youth Services Consultant for the South Carolina State Library, and she has worked in volunteers and volunteered in public libraries for, for 20 years. Wendy is the Grants Coordinator for the South Carolina State Library with over 10 years of experience administering federal grants programs. Um, there was a of a Health Information Outreach Award from SEA, which they've used to expand the South Carolina Read, Eat, Grow initiative. This initiative promotes healthy cooking and eating in rural communities. So I will pass things over to you, Rebecca. All right, thank you, Carrie. And I am actually gonna give control of the slides to Wendy. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as Terry said, um, my name is Rebecca Antle. I'm the Youth Services Consultant at the South Carolina State Library. Um, I've been there for about three and a half years. Um, my interest in food has, has kind of been lifelong. Um, I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Ohio where we raised and produced almost all of our own food. And it's been fascinating to me. Um, as I've done library programs and worked with children and families, um, the amount of people who don't understand where their food comes from. Um, so that's, that's been one of my major reasons for getting involved in food literacy and food programming at the public library. Um, and Wendy, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and your involvement with us. Um, yes. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. All right. So um, I also was uh, grew up on a farm and we grew all our own food and raised everything from fresh vegetables and fruits and all different types of things. But um, we had a roadside stand, so we always had people come and say that they loved our sweet corn or whatever it was. And now I'm that person finding the market that has the best sweet corn or fruits and vegetables, and it's, I, I like to put as many things as I can as fresh as they are, but sometimes it's hard to find. All right. Um, so there's quite a few people with us today. Um, I, I kind of wanted to get an idea of like how many people are from libraries, how many of you are already doing literacy. Um, if you wanted to type some of that in the chat, that would be, that would be very helpful. Um, but the format of our presentation, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what, how we define food literacy and what we're doing within those parameters um, in South Carolina, uh, why we started this project, and, and then some details about what we've done with our grant from NNLM. All right. So um, why food literacy? Um, Many of you may be familiar with the Culinary Literacy Center um, from the Free Library in Philadelphia. They were one of the first public libraries to kind of get into culinary literacy. Um, and I've had the privilege of visiting them several times, um, observing some of their programs, and it's really spectacular what they've been able to do there in the city of Philadelphia for their, for their residents. Um, but when we talked about bringing the program to South Carolina, we decided that we wanted to use the term food literacy um, because it's, it's a little bit of a larger umbrella uh, than saying culinary. So the definition of food literacy is being able to tell the story of your food, which fits perfectly with the library world. Um, and it's, it's an understanding of how our food grows, um, where it comes from, how it gets to our plate, how to prepare it, how to store it, what are healthier choices, um, how do those choices affect our bodies and our health overall? That, that whole umbrella of, of understanding. Um, and ultimately, with our food literacy programming, we are trying to combat both food insecurity and uh, food illiteracy and overall illiteracy in our communities. So we've been doing our Read, Eat, Grow statewide initiative. Um, almost three years now, uh, two, a little over two, 
and we wanted to encourage food literacy programming in our public libraries um, to increase information about and access to healthy food. Um, everything from how it grows, uh, safe handling, um, how to best prepare it, um, and, and much more. Um, we've watched and assisted our public libraries host programs with feed libraries, um, hosted farmers markets, uh, held food demonstrations, um, assisted with community gardens and um, community CSAs. Um, we try really hard not to limit the type of programming that the libraries want to do under this umbrella. Um, anything to do with anything to do with food, and it's it's really limitless. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the programming a little bit later on. Um, so, Read Eat Grow is is an initiative that um, provides information for people to make better choices about how and what they're eating overall. Um, why did we choose this path? Well, nationally, South Carolina does not look really good in the health rankings. Um, we rank 12th overall in obesity. Um, and that's one of those ratings where the, the closer to one you are, the worse it gets. So. Fault is not good. Um, and we also rank 13th in functional illiteracy. Um, and so we really felt like if we wanted to address one, we really should be addressing both. Um, and even though our, we're, we're known as an agricultural state and we have great weather and we're able to grow all sorts of, of fruits and vegetables throughout the year, um, we have an enormous number of our communities are in food deserts, um, both because although agriculture is one of our main exports here in South Carolina, it gets exported. <laughs> it's, it's, it's agricultural is, is one of our huge businesses, but it all gets sent to other states. Um, and, and so we have a large number of rural communities um, that are growing the food, but the, the food does not stay in their communities. Um, so for those of you who may not know, a food desert is an area where at least 33% of the population lives at least a mile from the grocery store. And in rural areas, um, they expand that definition to 10 miles. So at least 33% of the population in many of our rural counties lives at least 10 miles from a grocery store, if not more. Now they may very well have access to a gas station um, with a, a country type store where they've got canned goods, um, or maybe if you're lucky, some frozen food items. Um, they may be in a community that has a Dollar General. Again, lots and lots of canned goods and not very much fresh or frozen. Um, and, and so they may have access to food, but it's very difficult to make healthy choices with that food that is available. Um, so, so we have that issue. Uh, and if you wanted to look at um, food deserts for the United States overall, you can go to the um, USDA, USDA website uh, and they have the, the atlas of the food deserts there. Um, so, so we saw those issues going on across our state and both the, 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 the food deserts, the food insecurity. Um, the other definition that we've run across is, as we've gotten further into our, our, our research and knowledge about some of the issues is um, food swamps. And that describes many of our, our metropolitan areas where, um, so a food desert is there's not fresh produce located within a mile or within 10 miles. A food swamp is that there are so many bad choices available. Um, so you, you may be in, a, in a, an urban area with, again, um, that gas station with all of the snacks and the canned goods and half a dozen fast food restaurants um, with eight different kinds of fried chicken. And none of those choices are necessarily healthy. There are ways to make healthy decisions and, 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 and healthy choices there, but it's not, 
it's not easy, it's not simple, it's not straightforward. Um, so a lot of food insecurity revolving around food deserts and food swamps uh, in our state. Okay, so what, what does the public library gain from getting into food literacy programming? Um, well, the patrons gain um, because of you're addressing food insecurity, which is a big deal. Um, we all know the, the term hangry. When you're hungry, are you paying attention to anything? No, you're not really. Um, and we see this in our schools all the time. Um, kids who are hungry are, are not good learners. And there's a variety of studies that show that um, schools that institute free and reduced lunch across the board, no questions asked, free and reduced breakfast across the board, no questions asked, see behavioral incidences go down and test scores go up because hungry kids don't learn, but kids who know where their next meal is coming from, they're going to pay a little bit more attention in class. Um, so we address food insecurity. Um, we address health concerns in the community. Um, we improve test scores. Uh, we see higher social emotional learning, and we provide um, take home skills and behavior changes. The library itself benefits because you're getting increased circulation in some of your collections. Um, the cookbook collection is, is a great example, but also there's really fabulous picture books um, that deal with food and gardening and farming, and, and so it's a really great way to, to highlight areas of your collection that you wouldn't normally uh, be interested in doing. Um, program attendance goes up because you're providing relevant programming that is meeting the needs of your patrons right where they're at. Um, there's an increased interest in sustainable living, which is overall really good for your community. Um, just as creating a healthier community in general is overall good for everyone. And it helps create stronger partnerships. Um, we've seen a variety of partnerships um, um, come out of our food literacy initiative um, with everything from food banks to local gardening clubs um, to um, beekeeping associations and um, all sorts of different state and, and county agencies. And again, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but that's kind of the, the overview of some of the benefits to uh, the public library getting involved with food literacy. Um, here is a picture of our baby. Um, so this is the first cart that we got when we started getting into food literacy. This is the Charlie cart. Um, and we got him in the fall of, I'm trying to do math and it's never a pretty place for me. I want to say fall of 2018, but it could have been fall of 2017. Math, never a strong point for me. Um, and we got it because like most library spaces, um, our state library has no good place to do anything with food. I mean, we have our minimalized staff kitchen and it has a sink and a refrigerator. Um, oh, and an ice maker, not helpful for cooking something. Um, so if we were going to provide any type of training or food literacy demonstration, we needed a kitchen space. And rather than uh, try and talk our administration into completely renovating the building, it was much easier to get this mobile kitchen unit. So it has um, everything that you need for a basic food program, including a wastewater sink system, um, a, a oven, um, griddle, blender. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, to be honest. And it comes with um, sets of kitchen tools as well, and you can see those pictured. Um, and let's see. Do me a favor, Wendy, and go back to the first picture. Yep. Um, so this was a program that we did at our national or our um, statewide library association conference, um, and we actually cooked. Um, the, the hotel staff was a little bit anxious with us, um, but the cart plugged right in. We made muffins right there with the oven. 
Um, it was a lot of fun. And it's, it's so easy to do these food demonstrations. So that's a lot of what, that's kind of where we started, was working with food demonstrations with public library staff. Um, and from there, we knew that we wanted to expand the program. Um, we immediately started lending out the Charlie cart. It's on wheels. It weighs about 400 pounds. It's not the easiest thing to take around. Um, but all of the public libraries wanted to use it. So we would lend it out to public libraries around the state for a month or two at a time, and they would do programs with it. Um, and all of a sudden, we no longer had a mobile kitchen for doing training with. So I was like, okay, well, this has been very popular. Let's see how we can expand this program. So we did some looking around for grant projects, and we found um, the Help Outreach grant through NLM. So we went ahead and applied for that, and we got a second cart. Um, okay, let's see some more of those pictures, Wendy. So there's everything included. Very bright, very colorful. We absolutely love it. Um, one thing that I wanted to note on this picture right here is one of the things that we love about the cart is that it has all sorts of different tools for different um, ages and stages. So there are cutting knives. There's, there's a chef set of, of knives for adults. Um, and, and honestly, in working with both adults and kids, it's almost always the adults who cut themselves. So I, I really should be more careful about saying that the knives are for the adults. Um, it also has a smaller set of pairing knives that are appropriate to work with uh, older school-aged children and teenagers. Um, the first thing that we do in a program is we teach appropriate knife skills. Um, and then it also has these really lovely, and I don't know how well you can see it, these really lovely plastic, they're, they're pan scrapers is what they're for, and you'll see them at Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, but they cut, and they're perfectly appropriate for school-aged kids or preschoolers. Um, there's no sharp edges. I mean, you could probably draw blood if you really, really tried really hard. Um, but you can cut all sorts of fruits and vegetables with this edge that is not a sharp serrated edge and is perfectly appropriate to use with young children. And that's one of the other things that we love about what comes with the Charlie cart and as we've built out our own kits have made sure to include. Um, Rebecca, can I interrupt you with some questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, someone asked, do you have a list of the children's picture books that you mentioned? Yes, yes we do. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I managed to include it in our slides or not, but we have a LibGuide on our website, um, and it includes a book list that we've put together um, with titles for all ages. Um, it also includes the inventory of everything that's included in the Charlie Cart and our kits. And we're working on inputting um, a bunch of different programming ideas. It's not full yet, but that's one of my ongoing projects. That's great. If you send me the link to that, I'll email it to everyone after the presentation. Perfect. Did you Thank get you. funding for the first Charlie cart? We used LSTA funds. Um, Wendy, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was going to say that um, we're jumping ahead here, but that's okay. Um, we did LSTA um, funds from IMLS for the first Charlie cart, and then our second Charlie cart is where we got the funding from NNLM, and then we've also done kitchen in a box kits, which are not quite the full cart. It's all the stuff without the wheels and the box. <laughs> So yes, um, we we used we've we've used all sorts of different funding, and then um, one of our public libraries just got one as well, and they used a local grant from a local foundation. Um, I can't tell you the name right off the top of my head, but they were they were able to find local funding to use that for. Um, and you know, one of the, one of the notes that I want to make, and I, I think. It was later in the slides. I jump around a lot. I'm terrible. Um, this, is, this is why Wendy is running the slides. Um, like, I don't want this to be an advertisement for the Charlie Cart project because it is expensive and it, it is heavy as heck. It's 400 pounds to move around, and I'm one of the only people in the building that can move it. 
um, we transport it on, in a sprinter van with a hydraulic lift. And if you are a library with small hallways and tight corners, you're not going to be able to get it around in your building. It was, it was originally intended um, to be moved from classroom to classroom in a school setting. Um, and it's, it's not the worst thing ever, and I, and I love ours, and I, I, if I won the lottery, I'd buy another. Um, but it's, it has its issues, um, and it costs $10,000. Um, you can put together everything that's in it for about $1,000 minus the sink. Um, but it's also super handy. So, I, eh. Um, it also comes with a curriculum that is really helpful. Um, it's, again, it's designed for classrooms, um, and it's divvied up into um, grades K through five, and it has programs for fall semester and programs for spring semester, so it's, it's very seasonally based. Um, it's vegetarian, so you avoid a lot of issues about cross contamination and allergies, um, which is very helpful. And they give lesson plans, as well as um, book and story connections. Um, so the curriculum is also very helpful. You can order that separate from the cart. Um, we've gotten a lot of use out of that. Um, and it is aligned to science standards, um, English language arts, and common core math standards. Um, and gives directions for working with a group of 30 kids in a classroom what's appropriate for the kids to do, how much time it's going to take, things like that. So the curriculum is really good as well. Um, but again, it's expensive. Okay, so if we move on to our partners that we've got up here, uh, these are some of the ones that we've begun with and have been instrumental um, from a statewide perspective. Um, the, the main one has been DHEC, obviously. Um, my first conversation after I talked to my boss into getting the Charlie cart was with DHEC to say, are we even allowed to do this in the library? Um, and then from there, um, we reached out to um, all of our different food banks because we knew that they were going to have the connections to um, organizations within their communities, as well as already having the connections to the people in the community who needed our services the most. Um, and uh, the Low Country Food Bank here in South Carolina already had a Charlie cart and was doing programming with it. So we were able to go and see theirs in action and then observe it and um, assist with some of their programming and, and see, okay, this is how we'll be able to use ours. This is the good that it can do. Um, the National Farm to School Network um, has also been really, really great. Um, they're, all, they're connected with Ag in the Classroom, um, which has really great lesson plans for working in more information specifically about agriculture and agricultural careers, which is, is a, a really great connection for us to have here in the state with our working with our families and kids because it brings home to them what it is that we're doing. We've also really enjoyed working with the Farm Bureau. Um, they've been invaluable. Um, they put out a book every month um, with an agricultural or food theme and provide a lot of different um, programming resources and activities to go along with that book. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, and then another one of our major partners has been Cooking Matters, um, which is a nationwide program uh, Wendy just texted me that I need to talk faster or talk less, one or the other. Um, Cooking Matters is a nationwide program, and it's administered by whoever in your state is doing SNAP Ed, and it teaches classes to um, parents, families, kids, teenagers, seniors. Um, it breaks it out into age groups. It's a six-week course on how to change, how to implement healthy behaviors um, into your cooking. And I, I am a um, culinary instructor. I got certified to work with them, and I've, I've been able to bring them into several of our different public libraries. And it, it is fabulous. If, if you're a public library and you're worried about doing these programs on your own, find Cooking Matters in your community and offer your library as a space for them. 
um, or go wherever they're doing the programs already and partner up with them with, with book lists and books to check out and other ways that the library can help um, because Cooking Matters has it going on and it is, it's fabulous. Okay, so all of that was background information to what we have done with our NNLM project. Um, so we were doing all of that and I decided that of course I had oodles of time and wanted to do more. Um, so we went ahead and we wrote a grant for the second cart and additional supplies and training materials. Um, we had some interesting challenges along the way. Um, all of our training ideas that we started out with had to be switched up or tossed out entirely because of inner financial issues with paying for other people's training. Um, and then COVID happened and we weren't able to do in-person trainings. And the training that I had been working on with one of our local culinary schools, we were gonna do a full day long um, kitchen classroom training and we were no longer able to do that. And so there was, there was interesting challenges along the way. Um, our public libraries that we had decided to partner with, um, we had four of them that we started out with and they experienced uh, staffing issues, um, which we knew we were deliberately working with smaller library systems in rural settings. Thus, they have less staff and if you're missing one, it becomes a big deal. Um, so we had to learn to be very flexible with that um, and, and just kind of learn a lot of give and take. Um, and, and so that was interesting, but also look at the, 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 the look on that little girl's face as she is um, juicing a lemon. I mean, that makes everything worth it in my mind. I, 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 I would do whatever it takes to get that look of joy and concentration as she juices a lemon, which she had never done before. Um, so we started out in Chesterfield County Public Library um, in January. So we got our second cart in October, September of 2019, and we were originally going to start our programming um, late fall, early winter, and then because of some of the staffing issues that we experienced, we didn't, we didn't get that started when we wanted to. So we started out in January. Um, Chesterfield had the cart for two months, and they did um, two programs a month. They did Adulting 101 um, with teens, and that's the one that's pictured here. And they had a majority of boys that attended that program, and they absolutely loved it. Um, they made, I forget all that they made, but they made hummus, um, which was one of the recipes out of the uh, Charlie Cart curriculum. And it's a super fun recipe because it doesn't require cooking, but it's very hands-on. And there's a couple of different methods that you can use to make it. And so it's great to talk about different skill sets and, and preparation types. Um, they also did a healthy snacks program for children, and that was with preschoolers and their caregivers. Um, and they made banana pudding in a bag. Um, and they did a food safety class um, with a serve safe instructor um, for a group of high school students with special needs. Um, and that one just, oh, it got spectacular reviews. And both the teachers and the students um, were just, it, it, it was fabulous. Um, so that was Chesterfield. And then in March, we took the cart to Lexington County Public Library. Um, and we did Healthy Summer Snacks for Teens. And this young man here with me, um, we made breakfast burritos, and we made smoothies, and we made Rice Krispie Treats. And I'll explain the Rice Krispie Treats. Um, it is healthy, it's, you know. Um, the young man, he came with his twin brother. Uh, they are both 12, and they had some, some um, they had some disabilities and their mom was very nervous about bringing them. And she pulled me aside at the beginning of the class and she was like, they, they really only eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and SpaghettiOs. 
So I, I don't really, but they really wanted to come, but, but they don't help me in the kitchen. So I don't, she was very nervous. And I explained to her that it was perfectly fine. You know, we had three staff members in the room, so we had plenty of oversight. Um, we had six teenagers total at the program. Um, so it wasn't a huge, big group. Everybody knew each other. Um, and when we start out a program, we sit and we talk about like, what are some of the, what are some of our roles that we're going to put in place for, for cooking together? Um, one, if we make something, we're all going to try it because we all helped make it. Two, if we don't like it, it's okay, but we're not going to say ew. We never say ew. We say, I don't really like that. Um, and so that's what we did. And the, the, the boys started out, you know, I don't think I'm really going to like this. But they tried everything, and they ended up really liking the breakfast burritos. Um, but, the, but this young man, as you can see in the picture, he is cracking eggs um, for our scrambled eggs for our breakfast burritos, and he had never cracked an egg before. He had never beat an egg before. Um, so it was, it was, again, it's like the look on the little girl's face as she juices the lemon. This is why we do what we do, because they got to see the food happen in front of their faces. Um, and then Lexington County had also planned three different family programs um, with presenters from WIC and the Farm Bureau, and those got canceled because all of our libraries closed mid-March. Um, so, um, programming around the state outside of those four libraries has been extensive. Um, again, everything has been kind of on hold with, with the library closures due to the pandemic. Um, but many of the libraries that were already involved with food literacy have been very deliberate about keeping up the virtual programming. So we have a lot of, of virtual food demonstrations going on. Um, we have done, at the State Library, we have done a variety of different cooking videos. Um, and and linked to everybody else's cooking videos. So we've made sure to be sharing those around. Um, I would say out of our 43 library systems, solidly 25 to 30 of them are involved in food literacy programming to some extent. Um, and you can see on the next slide, you can see some of the other pictures of some of the programming that we do. Um, the one on the top, my right, is the CC cart that we got with the NNLM funds. Um, that's the, the group of teens um, that cooked together. Uh, the library staff told me they made quite a mess but had quite a bit of fun, which is the way it should happen. Um, and then you can see a couple other pictures from some programs that happened around the state with some of our kits. And let's see. Can I ask um, a few questions? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Rebecca, uh, so one person asked, this was a few slides back, um, what was the cost of having Cooking Matters come do programming with you? No cost. Um, there's no cost with that. Whatever organization that's hosting it takes on the cost, takes on the liability. Um, the one thing with that is um, that gets a little sticky with some of our libraries. Cooking Matters requires registration um, because it, 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 everybody who attends goes home with a bag of groceries each week for six weeks. And so there is a lot that goes into that program. So when they have attendees, they want those attendees to commit. Um, and that was an issue with one of the programs that we did at one of our public libraries because they had never offered a program that required registration before. And both library staff and library patrons were like, you want us to do what? Um, so, so that's one thing to keep in mind, as well as with working with any of your partners. A lot of our food literacy partners have been new and, and, and the libraries have never worked with them before. And so it's always good to go into that new partnership meeting um, and, and just kind of upfront talk about expectations and 
and um, gold. Um, because that was something that we hadn't really thought about being an issue, something as simple as registration. Um, so that was that was a tricky thing that that library had to work through. And it ended up okay, um, but there was about a week or so of frantic emails between the three of us with, with me going, whoa, 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 here's what they're actually saying. <laughs> whoa, 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 here's what they actually mean. Um, so so that, got, that got a little sticky. Um, but no, there's, there's no cost for the library. And like I said, that's a really great one to do because the instructors that come in and, and whatever organization, usually your, whatever organization that oversees your SNAP Ed, um, which is the um, food stamp program. So in our state, because we do things oddly in South Carolina, um, we have three different organizations that oversee SNAP Ed um, in three different regions. Most states have just one. Um, so it should be fairly easy to look for, but you can go to the Christian Matters website um, and type in your state and find out um, who provides that program. What other questions? Someone else, what, if any, demonstrations or programs have you targeted for senior citizens? Um, so I took part in a Cooking Matters one for senior citizens. Um, we've also done, um, with that same organization, we also did a walking program um, where we walked around outside the library and then came back in and, and talked about just, you know, easy ways of exercise and, and small changes to make with that. Um, we've done a lot of, um, I'm trying, uh, my words, I lost my words, sorry people. Um, Cooking on limited budget for for seniors who you know may only be getting certain certain amounts of money each week, um, as well as families. Um, we, we do this with families with SNAP benefits as well. Um, but we do um, you know all of the recipes that you can make for two hundred dollars a week or a hundred dollars a week, um, and and um, talk about those. We have a lot of libraries that do um, cookbook clubs. Um, with seniors, um, and they're they're honestly, I would say this about every age group, they're one of my favorite age groups to work with. Um, every time I walk into a seniors program and we start talking about like what they like to make or what they like to eat, and I'll inevitably have one who will be like, well, I'm 104 years old and I've eaten fried catfish all my life and you're not going to tell me that I can't have any more fried catfish, and I'm like, okay. That's fine. I like fried catfish too. I'm like, do you eat it three meals a day, seven days a week? And she's like, well, no. And I'm like, well, then okay. Now we have a place to start. Um, a lot of people expect us to walk in and give nutritional advice um, and be able to answer questions about the latest thing that their doctor told them. And don't be scared by this because it's the same approach to somebody walking in and wanting legal advice. We just say, you know what? I, I, I. Can't really answer that, but I can tell you that we're going to have a lot of fun making making breakfast burritos today, and we'll talk about some of the nutritional guidelines as we go through that. But if you want specific advice for you, you're going to have to go back and talk to your family doctor. There was another question about data collection and evaluation, but I'll see. I'm not sure if you or Wendy were going to talk about that um, during the rest of the presentation. We can, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's see where I'm at. Um, yeah. So here's a couple of different libraries that are also doing some really good stuff with food literacy. I highly recommend that you get in touch with them or look them up on look look up their websites. Um, the Culinary Literacy Center has a whole toolkit that is really really super helpful. Um, you can easily download that. Um, the ladies that run their program are incredibly helpful and are always willing to give advice. Um, Cuyahoga County Public Library has two Charlie carts as well, and they are doing a, a lot of programming with it, as you can see from their numbers. Um, and Ron Block is, again, always willing to give advice and talk about programming. Um, I highly recommend contacting him. Chattanooga Public Library has been doing food programming um, with teens for a number of years. Um, so there again, they have a lot of a, a lot of great tips and tricks um, 
And then Noah Lundstra up at the University of North Carolina Greensboro um, is working with a, a, a group, an organization that talks about um, having active exercise programs in libraries and, and healthy eating. Um, he's got a couple of different books um, that you can look for and, and does a lot of, of workshops and training. Um, so I, I definitely recommend, and there you can see some pictures from some of the other programs that Ron has done. Um, okay, move us on. All right, so some of the challenges that we've seen um, as far as training, um, reporting, um, liability, all of those types of things. Um, it can be very tricky to get your administration or the other organizations on board. Um, we've had a number of libraries who in the past were not able to serve any kind of food um, at a program, let alone even consider preparing food. Um, and I encourage you to, before you start that conversation with your admin, have a plan in place. Um, if, if, if there's no food programming allowed at your library, talk about the ways that you can offer programming that doesn't necessarily involve food prep. So you can do a gardening program and talk about um, and, 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 and exchange recipes um, that you can use for that zucchini when it grows. Um, you can do a, a seed program, a seed library, a seed exchange, and again, you don't have any food involved. Um, so you can do a lot of different things without actual food prep happening if, if that's where you're at. Um, I, I, I don't let that be a barrier. Um, as far as uh, safety and liability and waivers go, um, that was another conversation that I went ahead and had with our Department of Health right up front. Um, their answer for, for us in our situation, in our state, um, may be different from what your local health department would say. Um, so reach out to them and talk to them. For us, because we're not selling food, because we're not preparing and serving entire meals, um, our Department of Health was like, go do, you know, basically whatever you want within those guidelines. They recommended that we get the serve safe training. And so myself and my coworkers, um, who work on the Read Eat Grow team with me, we've all gotten the Serve Safe Food Manager training, which is an eight-hour in-person training, um, and it goes over all of the basics of food safety. Um, many of the public library staff who are doing the programming went and got the Food Handler version, which is an online four-hour course. Um, very inexpensive. You can do it all online, which is great right now. And again, it just walks you through the basics of food safety. And it's a nice thing to be able to say, um, I have this cert certification that says um, uh, that I've walked through all of these safety guidelines. Um, we use a waiver with all of our programs and we encourage all of our public libraries to do the same. Um, we're very very upfront with all of the recipes and the ingredients that we're preparing. Um, at the beginning of every program, we sit down and we look at the recipe and we go through the ingredients. Um, this is one of the ways that we incorporate reading into each program, but it's also a way for every person who's attending that program to know up front, this is what's going into that recipe. If I have any allergies, um, then I'm gonna know. And we ask, okay, now that we've read through our hummus recipe, is anybody allergic to garlic? Because I know that's a thing and we're gonna put lots of garlic in it because that's how I cook. So if anybody objects, say so now, so we know up front. Um, so that's, um, so the serve safe is really good. Um, like I said, share share your ingredients with patrons. Um, and if, if you cannot do food in the library whatsoever, find those people who are in the community who are working with the patrons that you wanna work with who are already doing food programming and find ways to partner with them outside your building. Um, and, and draw those lines of, of partnership and collaboration. Um, reporting. So uh, when we work with Cooking Matters, they have a very specific um, uh, set of surveys and reports that they do. Um, and 
it is, it's a pre-survey and a post-survey that all of the families work out. With our NNLM project, again, we have a very specific set of reports that we're doing for NNLM. Um, and it keeps track of the demographics of the patrons who have attended the program, as well as um, asks them about um, what they learned, would they like more programs like this, um, will they use information at home. Um, and then for any of the projects that are, or for any of the programs that are not associated with either of those, we strongly encourage our public libraries to use um, the project outcome surveys that ask a lot of those same questions. Um, what did you know about this subject beforehand? What do you know now? Do you plan to use this later? Um, some things like that. Does that answer the reporting question? Yes, it's thank not, you. Okay, good. <laughs> um, Wendy, go ahead and take a second and talk a little bit more about our grants and how okay. not to be intimidated by them. Well, right. So um, when Rebecca walked up in a kitchen, obviously um, we cannot afford to remodel and get a whole kitchen. So it's like you might think you need a kitchen, but maybe you just need the Charlie cart or there's another one that's called a kitchen a la carte, I think it's called. So there's different ways out there that you can do that. But if you were going to get a kitchen in a box, Rebecca said that we've done some for a thousand, but we've also done some for 300. You know, there's a range. So when you're thinking about getting a grant and applying for one, you don't have to think I'm going to get a hundred thousand dollar kitchen. You can think I'm going to get a ten thousand dollar Charlie cart, or I'm going to get a five to a five hundred to a thousand dollar um, just a kitchen in a box, or just some programming things. You can get grants from all different sources, and I obviously love grants and think they're easy and fun. So I'm always encouraging people just think about where could you get a grant for this project, and it might be that you can work with a partner. And you might not be a grant, but it might be the partnership where they give you they give you the food, and then you have another partner who has the kitchen. We've we've known people who have worked with one group that had the kitchen, and another group brought in the 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 children, and someone else brought in the programming. It's all about that partnership that Rebecca was talking about early on. So if you can't if you don't have the money, you don't have the resources, you might could find a partner, or you can find someone that can help you with the grants. Um, start small and then get big. And um, most of our states have state libraries. Well, that, I think they all have state libraries in some form. They're just not all exactly like ours. But a lot of them do sub-grants with the LSTA programs. And that's one easy way to do small programming in your library. Some of them do mini grants, some of them do large grants. Some of them don't do grants, but they have people who can help you find those grants and research foundation money if you can't get federal grants. Okay, so let's do questions. If there are any other questions. Also, you know, um, our contact information is at the bottom, um, and I'm sure Kiri will share it. Um, feel free to reach out to Wendy or I um, with any question that you may have. We are happy to share what we're doing. Um, we are obviously passionate about what we're doing. Um, I love it. Um, I, I love sharing what we're doing and, and helping other people get that started. So don't don't hesitate to ask. Um, we could have There's a question from Joyce that asks, uh, what results have y'all been able to see from your food literacy initiatives? Um, so we've seen a lot more interest from the public in um, food programming. Um, we've seen so, several of our libraries have made the decision to become summer feeding sites. Um, and prior to doing any type of food programming, they were very leery about that. So it was it was it was a really great launch pad for introducing other services. Um, so we've seen we've seen a lot of services grow out of this. Um, one of the other results has been stronger partnerships um, in communities with organizations that the library wouldn't necessarily 
necessarily have thought of. Um, so, so partnerships is a great one. Um, lots of lots of programs that come out of starting with this. Um, uh, the benefits that we talk about, um, they are on that, that one of those first slides in the beginning. Um, libraries are, are able to highlight portions of their collection and see greater circulation numbers in those than they were before. Um, and, and just a lot more excitement about, oh, the library is interested in doing this? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, like the, the program that Chesterfield did with their high school students, several other of the high schools are interested in that same program now. Um, the program that one of our libraries did um, with um, Cooking Matters seniors, um, the seniors want that now basically every other month. Um, so they decided to start up their own, basically what they're having is a cookbook club now. Um, where the seniors all gather together at the library and talk about their favorite recipes. So we've been able to see a, a one-time program become uh, an ongoing interest, which is very exciting. Allison said, I'd love to work more on adult programming, but a large portion of our daily adult patrons are homeless. Do you have any ideas of how to adapt food programming for those who can't easily make their own food choices? Ooh. Yes, and I have resources. Uh, ooh. Email me that question, Allison, and I can help you a lot better. Um, we've got a couple of libraries that are dabbling in that, and I can connect you. I'm going to jump in quickly just to wrap things up for people who do need to leave right now. Um, Thank you all for attending. If you'd like to claim MLA CEs for coming to this presentation, the code, or I'm sorry, the URL for the NNLM evaluation that you'll use to get that CE code is on the screen right now, and I will drop it into the chat box once again. Um, I mentioned earlier in the chat uh, specific Awards and funding opportunities from NNLM vary a lot from region to region. If you are in the southeastern Atlantic region, you can contact me um, with questions about the specific award that they used for uh, the expansion of the Read, Eat, Go, Grow program, but the more general URL is on the screen right now, um, so you can go see what awards are available in the region where you live. So with that, um, again, this presentation was recorded. I'll send you a link to the recording once everything is uh, posted and prepared. I'll also send an email with links to a few of the resources that Rebecca mentioned throughout the presentation and their contact information so that you can get in touch with them if you have more specific questions. And yes, I will send out a copy of the slides. So thank you all so much for joining us today, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I lost the chat. Did we have more questions? There was a bunch. Ah, there we go. Um, somebody asked us about sharing the grant application. I don't have, I don't see why we can't do that. That was Julia. As long as Kiri doesn't mind, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy Julia, to Julia, if you're it. still here, I think I can send it to you. Yeah, Julia, if, if you, if you email me, um, I can send you what they submitted uh, last year. Perfect. And then, like, we didn't really get into it, but we just applied for a second one and got it. So we're going to be further expanding on everything that we did. So it's 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 something that our 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 communities have really responded well to, and our libraries love. And there's a lot of excitement and passion around it. So I'm willing to do whatever we can to support that 
for as long as the interest is there. And luckily enough, NNLM feels the same way. <laughs> Um, so yeah, because, because we weren't able to do the training that we wanted to do, we decided to build the kitchen in a box kit. Um, so that will enable our four public library partners to continue doing programming far into the future, um, when the Charlie cart is going to be occupied in other places. And then from the success that we've seen with those kits, um, in, in the libraries that already have them, we thought, oh, how about we see if we can replicate those on a larger scale? Um, so that was the basis of our second grant with NNLM, was we were able to get money to go ahead and do that, to, to replicate those kitchen in a box kits on a larger scale. Um, we're looking at 15 different libraries this time, and um, a much, much more emphasis on the health partnerships in the community. Um, so we'll we'll see how this goes. It looks like Kim is still here, and she asked uh, a while back uh, about the SNAC organization that you mentioned. Did she mean SNAP? She's, she's still hot here. I'll see if she chimes in with what she says. clarification. Do you have um, do you have the organizations that you've partnered with on that LibGuide? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the the food banks have been spectacular, and that would be that would be one of my first visits um, with Allison's question about working with homeless adults would be the food banks and the shelters um, because our food banks offer a variety of of food prep programs um, when they do the the kitchens and, and et cetera and they and they hand out food um, so that would be the perfect place to reach that population um, and then having a conversation with the with the local shelters and and kitchens um, who are, are also feeding um the homeless adults and, and 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 finding out with them where there are partnership and collaboration opportunities that would be that would be where i would start Okay, so I'm scrolling through. I think we got all of the questions that came in the chat box. All right. I don't see any new ones. Thank you, Jeanette. We were very, I was kind of shocked that they decided to take us on again, but <laughs> the um, one of the biggest issues that we've had actually in working with the public libraries is getting getting the food for the for the programs because the way that our public library budgets are set up, they're not necessarily allowed to buy food for programming. It's not something that we at the state library can easily do either. Um, and so that's one of the things that my, myself and my team is working on now is finding a grant that we can use specifically to purchase the ingredients that we want to be able to use, that we want our libraries to be able to use. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Obviously, we'll be doing another webinar to report on our second grant, and hopefully there will be success. All right, thank you so much. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Um, I will be in touch with you to maybe just assemble some links that I can send out to everyone along with the slides and the link to the recording whenever it's available. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank Kira, you. for the opportunity.